Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing nonviolent journalism and a new book called Nonviolent Journalism, a Humanist Approach to Communication. Our guests are two of the authors. Pia Figueroa Edwards is from Chile, a former Under Secretary of State of Chile and former environmental advisor to the Minister of Agriculture. She is Vice President of the Pangea Foundation and Director of Tempo Consultores. Since 2008, she has been co-director of Presenza International Press Agency. And Tony Robinson is from the UK and has been an activist for peace and nonviolence. He has been a writer, an editor, and finally a co-director for Presenza International Press Agency, specializing in matters of peace and disarmament. In 2019, he produced the award-winning documentary film, The Beginning of the End of Nuclear Weapons. Pia and Tony, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, thank you, David. It's great to be here with you and to share it with Tony. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming on. I, I want to also mention that there will be uh, an event about this book we're going to discuss happening on May 9th in Washington, D.C., and people can find that information at presenza.com and at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, why don't we tell people about Crescenza and how long it's been around and what it does? Well, it's 15 years we have been working with this agency, which is completely done thanks to volunteer work. And uh, we are in about 40 or more countries in several cities in the world with teams. We work in nine languages every day and you can find us in presenza.com. Um, maybe Tony wants to add some more. Yeah, we uh, we specialize, we've got a very, a very particular uh, set of themes that we're interested in, human rights, the fight against discrimination, peace, disarmament, um, all these kind of topics. Anything to do with, with human progress is something that we're interested in covering in Presenza. Um, wonderful. It's good to know there is so much uh, human progress. I, I wouldn't have had any idea. Um, and this book, uh, tell us about the origins of this book. There was a Spanish version and now there is an English one? Yes, and it's in process to be translated to French, to Italian, to German and to Greek. Um, but we have the English version finally, and it will come out in New York next week. So it's fresh, fresh from the printing house. And um, it collects our work during these 15 years. But basically, you know, uh, in the journalist schools and universities, they tell you that there is nothing else to write about journalism, that everything has been done already. And that is a matter of study well in order to apply those principles and do a good job. But it's for us, it's not like that. The way we see the world, the way we we tell the other ones about the world is very important. So it's not an objective um, uh, work, but job, but it's a very subjective job. That's why we have chosen the way of looking, which is a nonviolent way. The, the book, in fact, seems uh, excellent for journalists and journalism students, but maybe even for people who are constantly asking me, where do I find good journalism? Because it tells them what to look for. Um, who, who, is, who is the book meant for? Well, I would say that it's, I mean, it, We've, we've targeted it um, thinking about uh, schools of journalism, yeah, university departments, colleges, this kind of stuff, but also for for activists in, in social organizations. You know, often they're producing press releases, they want to get their messages out, mm -hmm. and, and the, the way that we approach communication uh, can help anyone really in, in any of those different settings. So it's really, we've really taken, you know, the as you said in the introduction to the book, we've really taken all of our trial and error, all of our successes and failures, all of the work that we have done over 15 years, and, and we've kind of systematized it 
down into into a methodology which now we're we're able to teach and and we first started teaching nonviolent journalism i think it was back in 2016 um in various universities in in ecuador where where presenza uh was first legalized and um and over the years we've gathered all of this all of these tools and resources and and ways of 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 thinking about journalism and we've kind of compiled it into, into this book which which we are now actually formally teaching to to new students it's it's a wonderful book and it goes from a philosophy of of life down to specific examples of of good journalism and it starts out with uh with a definition of violence that's that's very broad can you can you explain maybe what you mean by violence and consequently by nonviolence? You go, Tony. So, you know, violence we traditionally see as you know, the physical acts of violence, so punching people or wars or you know, um, rapes and these kind of things, which are, you know, where, where someone with their physical force or a group of people with their physical force are imposing themselves and actually, you know, hurting other people. Um, the definition that we take in in nonviolent journalism in Presenza is a definition which was first developed by by the South American um, spiritual guide Silo, and um, he in a, in in one of his speeches in 1969 he he broadened it to say that violence is anything which creates pain and suffering in human beings. So. It expands from like the physical act of violence to other forms of violence, which are economic, psychological, the imposition of one mora of a morality on other people. So it's essentially what happens is that before we get to a physical act of violence, there are all kinds of other forms of violence which which lead up to that explosion of, of physical violence. So what we're interested in doing is uncovering all of the roots to this physical violence, showing what is lying underneath it, and there, thereby helping to, uh, you know, adding to the, to the, to those, to the activists all around the world who are looking for good information on which they can base their own uh, campaigns and, and, and their actions. So we start from that broader definition of violence, which for us makes complete sense because, you know, I'm, I don't go around punching someone unless I have been subjected to a great deal of uh, of psychological um, stress or economic stress. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And, and so part of violence is unjust and harmful structures and systems. Uh, and later in the book, you talk about journalism going after not just individuals that are doing harm, but but structures, right? Yes. Yes, for instance, um, um, female, uh, the, all the females movement, all the feminist movement is claiming for to stop the patriarchal violence, which many times is not yet physical. It ends up in a physical aggression, but it starts with very subtle little jokes and little ironic phrases, you know, that that start from the thought that you consider all females someone that is not as important or as equal as men and that is violence also yeah there's there's a bit also uh, still near the beginning of the book on ideological violence that sounds almost like a, a description of most of the, the big media outlets out there uh, if i could just quote this it says the imposing of official viewpoints, the prohibition of free thought, the subordination of the communications media to particular interests, the manipulation of public opinion, propaganda for ideas that are inherently violent and discriminatory, but convenient to the ruling elite. Uh, that's a great definition of, of violence. And, and you even talk about obedience as a form of violence, which I think to many people's ears would sound like the opposite, but with the example of the Milgram experiments, for example, mm -hmm. too much obedience yes. is is violence, right? Yes, it's like it's the you know, people are not are not always well equipped to deal with the violence that surrounds them. You know, we are trained since birth to 
to accept the conditions that surround us, uh, to not question them. And so when someone in, um, in, in a position of authority, someone comes along, they wear a, a lab coat and they say, um, please do this, please do the other thing. Then people feel, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure that I'm qualified enough to, to say yes or no in, in those situations. We kind of, we kind of lost that connection with that in, in, inner voice within us that knows what's the difference between right or wrong. We know when we are treating other people the way that we don't want to be treated. Yeah. And, and yet somehow we are told to kind of ignore those signals coming from within and just follow what the outside uh, reference is saying to us. And we're, you know, nonviolent journalism is, is also about kind of a, a, an awakening, an internal awakening to all of the violence which is happening in the world and saying, right, we don't have to accept it, we can organize ourselves and we can do something about it. Uh, another element I love about, about your work and about your account of it in this book, uh, Tony Robinson and, and Pia Figueroa, is that uh, nonviolent journalism reports on nonviolent activism, uh, which is generally left out. And the notion yes. that nonviolent activism ever accomplishes anything is generally left out of, of other media, right? Yes, yes, we are in, in, in contact with so many movements all around the world, all around that move um, move the world in that direction. Maybe not to the media, they don't reach the media, but from Greta Thunberg, you can um, see all the young people moving in environment. You can see in all the feminist movement, so many women you can see in the farmers in India, for instance, the huge movements they have to protect their rights and to protect water and their carbs. Yeah? yeah. So many movements, indigenous movement here in Latin America that claim for their rights and that they take care of the environment in a different way. Well, we're the Really, the majority of the people is is rather in these kind of activities more than except, uh, in the in the power thing, no. But the news never go to them. They never have the voices in the programs or space in the TV, you know. Yeah, the, very yeah. little, very little. A, a, a media outlet like the Washington Post will tell you once every. 10 years, they'll tell you that there was some activist rally or march yesterday. They'll never tell you there's one next week. They'll tell you right. a bill was voted on, but they'll never tell you a bill is going to be voted on next week. Here's what you can do about it. They'll say that would be participating in activism. Uh, yes. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that, you know, we one of the principles that we talk about in the in the book is, is the fact that we are we're going beyond we're beyond journalism we're getting we're, we're part of we're part of a current of activism and i think it's very important to disabuse ourselves of the idea that any form of media any form of communication can be objective yeah that objectivity doesn't exist every media organization out there has an agenda they have paymasters they have people who are telling who are telling the people working in those media organizations you can write about that you can't write about that and i think that you know there's a great example going on at the moment with this um nord stream pipeline which was blown up by by the apparently by the by the us government if you believe um seymour hersh's uh, account um, which you know, why would we? Why would anyone doubt Seymour Hersh's account, given his his uh, his history in, in journalism? Um, and and yet there are there are people, senior people in media organisations, who are saying, don't talk about any of that. Well, to start with, you might think, well, you know what? These media organisations, they're just being negligent. They're being you know not being careful. They're not thinking clearly but you have to come to the conclusion that it's deliberate that the media out there are deliberately withholding information that they don't want the public to know about so you know along comes presenza and we say we don't you know we want we're practicing non-violent communication so what does that mean we're going to very much put our 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 heart on our sleeve and say these are the kind of things that people should know about this is how you can get involved if you want things to change these are the kind of actions and you know 
by publishing a story about a group in in rural Peru who have found a way in order to improve something in their community can be inspiring for another community in Namibia who until they've read about this thing in Presenza have not had the, have not been exposed to that idea so you know that's kind of where we're coming from with this David yeah in uh, this, this wonderful book nonviolent journalism there is also a wonderful introduction by Jan Oberg uh, who actually writes in in support of the word uh, objectivity but i think what he means by it as many people might is is accuracy professionalism yeah. doing a good serious job where nonviolent journalism clearly welcomes a point of view or even multiple points of view yeah. right just tell us what your point of view is i mean don't tell don't give us information and without telling us your point of view because uh, otherwise you know, we how do how do we know how do we know the criteria on which you have you have chosen the information to give me? You know, our, we're very we're very clear. You know, we want we're going to publish stuff which is going to help the benefit of 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 all of, of humanity, which is going to help stop wars, which is going to help people have freedom of thought and expression, all these kind of things. So, um, yeah. It, it, it's almost opening a door to dishonesty to to make a reporter pretend not to have a point of view while obviously writing from some point of view, right? Correct. It's Correct. impossible to do it without a point of view because we have each one of us has an internal world, an internal landscape, a way of being formed, some values. We look for a future in a certain way. And all that that constitute our internal landscape is the filter with which we filter reality. We, I look at reality in a different way than you look because we have different uh, positions in the world, in our families, in our countries, uh, in our culture. So all that acts, whether I like it or not, in any act of my life. So it's better to study which is the landscape my internal landscape, the landscape of formation in which I was formed and from where I look at the world and make it explicit, yeah? And make it obvious as the subjective filter with which I will do my job. And and part of the, the idea of nonviolent journalism, according to this book, is to include lots of other people's points of view, first person, accounts from yeah. people who are usually left out or are victims yeah. or are activists, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing that happens, David, is that in the measure that you practice this kind of journalism, you need to change your own point of view. You need to overpass your own violence. You discover it. You realize that you exert violence also, and you need to overpass it in order to go forward. So it transforms yourself at the same time, yeah. A, 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 an excellent idea. Um, it, there's there's also a, a principle uh, articulated in the book that information should be public, uh, and there's examples like COVID research better public than for profit and kept secret for no good reason, et cetera. Uh, and government secrets, presumably lots of them because you support whistleblowers and truth tellers rather than uh, as we've seen with the Pentagon's latest leaker, the, the media outlets that use the stories nonetheless going after the source of the information on behalf of, of law enforcement. Um, but what about uh, you know what about nuclear secrets? What uh, what what should be public and what shouldn't be public? Uh, I think that there's a question like where, where does information come from? Yeah, where, who 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 owns information? Is you know where you know because we don't without some hominids two million years ago banging some rocks together and learning how to discover fire you know, how to make fire, you know, we wouldn't be where we are now. Should we all be paying a, a copyright to those hom to those hominids? You know, because today's in today's world, that would be what happened. If we didn't have fire now and someone invented it, it would be copyrighted and we'd have to pay for it. And so all the knowledge that we have is built up. It's an accumulation of knowledge by every single 
uh, inhabitant of this planet that has ever lived. We all have um, we all have a common ownership of everything that has been discovered until now. So for some people to hold on to that information and use it and use it to make other people die, which is essentially what they're doing, then, um, you know, until we can bring down that, that, that whole purpose, we're not going to be a, a, enable, you know, a the development of humanity so that every single human being on this planet can live a dif- dignified life. An excellent goal for journalism. Um, the the introduction to the book, I, I mentioned uh, critiques uh, existing corporate major uh, journalism that falls short and looks at the corporate consolidation, the echo chamber, the lack of experts, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it, it is, is it getting worse and worse? Yes. 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 Absolutely, everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You, know, you just have to. I mean, I I live in the UK, so we, you could you know everyone respects the BBC. It's a you know it's a, this kind of like monolithic, fantastic media uh, organization. But you know the way that they have treated anyone in the uk which is working towards a better standard of living for everyone they are just absolutely either ignored or they are hounded out of public uh, out of public life and um and it's a tendency which is getting worse and worse the right wing all around the world are the owners of of the, the mainstream media and they are uh, and they decide what goes in uh, on the agenda on the news agenda and and they don't care who who uh, who they offend in the pro- in the pro- in the process. Yeah, no, yeah okay. I live. I on the contrary, I lived in Chile. I live in Chile in a South American country, very far away from the UK. And we had a referendum some months ago in order to vote for a new proposal of constitution. Yeah. A great, great work. And we obtained just 38% of approval because of the intense, really intense campaign of the media, especially the big medias that are the ones blamed as the responsibles of this uh, refusal, of this uh, um, failure, rejection. So, So yes, the media had a tremendous influence and they, they work for their interest, basically for their economical interest. They are very conservative. Yes. Yeah, Oberg says he's writing about global trends and specifically Scandinavian, where he's from. Uh, and he complains about uh, when he's quoted in the media as a peace activist, how they frame it and correct it and so forth. But I'm I'm still jealous because in the United States nobody's quoted as a peace activist at all, right? So there are <laughs> there are degrees of this. Yes, but, which is why we publish all of your all of your articles religiously yes. Yes. in Presenza, David. Thank you, thank you. Um, it, 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 he he also writes about how these corporate media outlets don't report on war. They participate in war they take a side right this is the very hardest thing for anybody to do is to oppose both sides of a war how do you how do you do that as a journalist well i think you have to you have to look for the information you have to look for what's going on um really on on the ground you have to you have to yeah and you have to put context to it because a war doesn't come out of nowhere a war you know (laughs) The way that this everyone has been talking about the mainstream media have been talking about the Ukraine war is the unprovoked war in Ukraine. Yeah, they and they have to use the word unprovoked to to try and make you think that it's unprovoked because it's clearly a provoked war. You know, it goes back, you know, thirty years to the end of the 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 Cold Cold War um, when you know NATO started to to need uh, a new. Uh, uh, a new bad guy in order to justify its existence. And so um, you can't understand the situation which is happening in a conflict if you don't look at the context of it. And you can't ab- advance in negotiations of any kind unless you put all of that context on the table and you say, right, 
Ukrainians need security. Russians need security. None of those people living in that area are particularly interested in killing each other unless someone else comes over here and says those people are trying to steal what you've got. Yeah, and that's what's going on in, in, that, in that region. So we, through through nonviolent journalism, and also this builds on the work of, of peace journalism, which has been developed by, by Galtung and, uh, and many others over, over the years. Um, you know, it's, it's a new way of reporting about uh, events, which enable people to have better information with which to then form an opinion about that event. Should, should one of the goals of journalism be to create dialogue and interchange and exchange of ideas as, uh, as opposed to the, the name calling and pie throwing that we see on, on television? And, and if so, how do you do that? Yes, one of the principles that we sustain is the need of reconciliation. Nonviolent journalism points towards reconciliation in the conflicts. And we try to sit, sit people together in the same table, around the same table, and let them talk. And we, we try to interview one and then make another interview of the other side and put both, both points of view together. That's a great job that we can do as journalists to, to help dialogue and look for a deep reconciliation. One of the processes we followed the most uh, near was the peace process in Colombia, which was a very, very intensive and long process looking for peace until they arrived to the, to the peace agreement. And the implementation of that agreement has been always also followed up by Presenza. Yeah. Just, just the act of reporting on peace yes. negotiations happening in Yemen or in Ethiopia or where Sudan, it, it's yes. not usually reported on. It, there's there's right. a war and then there's not a war, but there's no, no coverage of how peace is negotiated. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah. with Colombia, we follow up very near all the talks held in Cuba, and also we, we had long interviews with the people going there, you know, to sit in the tables of negotiation. That is very, very important because it's a lesson for the rest of the world. Yeah, we, we have just a few minutes left. I'm afraid uh, maybe each of you could say a few words on how people can get in touch and keep up with your work or contribute to what you're doing. Uh, I would invite to come to the Washington presentation in May 9. Uh, maybe you can tell them where and, and at what time it will be. Maybe in the next week, we will have the exact details for that. But it will be fantastic if anyone wants to come and wants to follow up such presentation. This, this should be May the 9th, uh, 5 p.m. at Busboys and Poets at 14th and V Streets in Washington, D.C. But, <laughs> but people should be able to find it at presenza.com and worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, Tony, last word? Yeah. yeah, and of course, you know, anyone who's interested in, in the work that Presenza is doing can visit us at presenza.com. Uh, we are currently uh, in, a, in the English language uh, team, we are currently in our second course of nonviolent journalism, um, and we will be uh, holding more courses in the future. But you know, there's a, we have an email address in uh, training at presenza.com if anyone listening to this wants to, to find out about it, and we can put them on the mailing list for the next course. Everyone's more than welcome. I expect a lot of people will. That's wonderful. We have been speaking with Tony Robinson and Pia Figueroa Edwards, who are co-directors of Presenza, and you can find it at presenza.com. The book is called Nonviolent Journalism, A Humanist Approach to Communication. Pia and Tony, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. 
There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.